Psalm 42. You, you might be going, what? And I'm, I'd be going, um, as the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee, right? Any, who's old enough to remember that? Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, here we go. Psalm 42. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come to appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night. While they say to me all the day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I would go with a throng and lead them in procession to the house of God. With glad shouts and songs of praise a multitude-keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation, and a bit of verse 6, and my God. Remain standing, let us sing, the King of love. shepherd is whose goodness faileth never I nothing lack if I am his and he is mine forever and he is mine forever Streams of living water flow, my ransom soul he leadeth, and where the burdened pastures grow, with food celestial feed, never fail. shoulder gently lay, and home rejoicing brought me. In death's dark veil I fear no will, with thee the Lord beside me. Thy rod and staff my comforts fill, thy cross before to God. Shepherd is never 
servants, host of heaven, all creation, praise the name of the Lord, night and morning, sing his glory now and forevermore. Earthly kingdoms, all dominions, bow before him. Name of the Lord, none as holy, none as worthy now and forevermore. Crown with adoration, he is high above the nation. Raise us from the ashes 
ashes, He has turned our grief to gladness, who is like the Lord our God, who is like the Lord our God, there is no one like our God, there is no one like our Satisfy us in our numbered days. Establish every effort while we wait from everlasting. You
Be seated. From the psalm that we sang prior to 90 right there, Psalm 113. Let's uh, use this as a springboard into prayer time and um, preparing for our message this morning. Psalm 113. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and is glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God who is seated on high? who looks far down on the heavens and on the earth. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. He gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we have just sung and read and directed our attention to you, the Lord of all. Lord, I pray that you would just take control of this service and that you would be glorified in it, Lord, that as saints we would we would be we would edify each other to good works and striving to please you in a manner that you are worthy of all praise. Lord, we spoke of your holiness in the last hour. We sang of your holiness already here together this morning. We recognize that you are holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Speak to our hearts this morning, Lord. Use our dear elder, our brother, our servant, our leader, Scott Smith, this morning um, to just proclaim, proclaim the scriptures, um, to proclaim your name to honor you, Lord Jesus. A text that we've been studying here on, on during the Sunday school hours is from 1 Peter. And Lord, I pray that the, um, the way that you have spoken it to our brother Scott would be very clear to us today and the other text that he will be using. And just the point that you impressed upon his heart to speak to us today, Lord, may it be impressed upon our hearts as well. Help us to be mindful of you, Lord Jesus. We glorify you. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. Good morning, everyone. The title of today's sermon is Inexpressible Hope. Um, you know, like, we always have hope, right? Like, I was hopeful Wally and Debbie would have a good cruise, and then when he didn't, I was hopeful he would preach. So, like, our hope ebbs and flows a lot of times in what we do things. But uh, this is actually a uh, sermon. I, I've changed it a little bit, but we did this in, uh, on New Year's Eve in Terra so if you were there, some of this stuff might sound familiar to you, some of it maybe not, but we're going we're gonna to bounce around some scriptures, because what we want to really look at here is we look at, at hope. When we look at our world, there's a lot of chaos, there's a lot of confusion, and there's a lot of hopelessness. And we in here, if we are His, 
are different. We don't have hopelessness. We actually have hope. And there's reasons that we have hope that won't make sense to anybody that does not know who Christ is or does not truly know them as their Savior. So there's a lot of weight that comes down onto that. So with that, I want to ask you to turn to 1 Peter. And we're going to look at uh, chapter 1, and we're just going to look at the first three verses there. We're going to read through these, and then we will come back uh, to this as we, get, as we go through the message here. So when you found that, if you would, please stand, and we will read that together. So 1 Peter 1, 3 through 9, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last times. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes through its test, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Father, would you please just take your word and let us be mindful of it and reveal to us, Lord, your truth through it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. All right, so as we, as we go through this, as we go through some different verses here, I, I thought back of times that our country has been inspired by the possibility of hope. Okay, we've seen it throughout history, probably one of the most prominent times, and you know, most of you may or may not know, I'm a little bit of a political junkie, right? I like, uh, you know, uh, not as bad as what I used to be. I mean, whenever, uh, let's see, in, in 2004, uh, I graduated college in 2004, so I don't know how old I would have been at that point in time, 22, 23 years old. And the hobby that my now wife, I had her sit down to watch with me was we sat down and watched the Republican National Presidential Convention and the Democrat National Pub, uh, Convention um, leading into the 2004 presidential election. I don't even know if Beth knew there was a presidential election that year before she met me, but I was mindful of it. And I can remember in 2004 at the at the at the DNC, one of their keynote speakers was somebody that I was actually a little bit familiar with just because I followed the political scene, but to others he was a relatively unknown state senator who stood up to give a keynote speech, and his name was Barack Obama. And in 2004, he got elected into the United States Senate, which is a six-year term, but four years into that term, in 2008, he made a run for a presidential, as a presidential candidate. His whole message in 2008 was hope and change, right? People were looking for hope, and that was a motivating message that inspired and captivated a large portion of the country. Whether you agreed with the politics of it or not, it motivated a base so much that in the 2008 presidential election, that message, and and this was the message, it wouldn't have mattered who the candidate was, but the message that was communicated effectively of hope and change captivated an audience of 69 million people, or sorry, 67 million people. 67 million people. That was almost 10 million more votes than any presidential candidate had ever gotten in the history of the world. So the message of hope is what everybody is looking for. And we, I mean, look now, we are however many years away from that now, and we're almost, I guess we're almost 20 years from that, would that be right? And 2028 would be 20 years. Wow, time flies, right? And that message has since died off. The, the, the prospect of hope 
And what gives that hope has now changed, and it has been redirected, and it changes with the wind all the time. But we are going to look at a hope that doesn't ever change. And before we, to understand this hope that doesn't change, there's a few things that we have to understand about God, all right? And we're going to take a look at these as we go through it. The message of God is that God is good. Now, if you were like me and raised in a country church around here, and maybe a bigger church, I don't know, but I know in the small country church, the mantra of, of almost every church service, I can remember the pastor standing up and saying, God is good, and the congregation would repeat, all the time, right. I mean, that was just, that was the mantra. And I sat back and, you know, I would say that also. And then you step back and you, you sit there and you say, do I really believe God is good all the time? Look at what's happening in this world. Look at what's going on. Where does this mantra even come from that God is good? Why, like, what's that even mean? So we're going to look at a couple of verses here because what we're going to see here is that God is good and he helps us in our weaknesses and... God is good and uses all circumstances for those who love him. So if you got your Bible out, you can either try to flip with me as we go through some of these verses, or, yeah, you can just jot down, but I want you to go back and check the references. Hold me accountable to the Word of God, because, you know, while it is, I would much rather just take verse by verse, there was no chance in this world that I was going to take Genesis 34 that Wally left off with to come and try to explain that to you, you know. <laughs> We're going to let him do that. So you get a topical message here from me. But when we see these two things, that God is good and helps us in our weaknesses, and he uses all circumstances for, for those who love him, we, we're reminded, man, like I think about the Apostle Paul in um, 1 Corinthians 12, and it's in verses 9 through 10, where he says, you know, Paul has just went through the thorn in the flesh, and he said he's pleaded with the Lord three times to take it for him, and every time the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you. Right? And then he goes on to say, my grace is sufficient, um, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Okay? That's, that's God's power is made perfect in weakness, not our power. And it might shock some of us to actually sit here and think is that, man, we, we, we have weaknesses. You know, we don't want anybody to think that we have weaknesses, right? But we have weaknesses. So let's look at what the Apostle Paul writes here in Romans 8. 26 through 28, and it might be a little smaller on your screen. I don't, you know, I apologize for that, but I'm trying to squeeze it all into one screen here while I'm looking at it. But it says, likewise, the Spirit. So we're looking here. We got the Spirit, okay? He helps us in our weaknesses, all right? We see this word weakness. So that is determining one thing right off the bat. We have weaknesses. We have to have weaknesses. We are not God. So there's things that we are weak in, mainly everything compared to God, but there's other things that we are not near as strong as in. And one of those things that the Apostle Paul is talking about here is prayer. Look at this. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Have you ever thought about your prayer life? Like, even if you think you have a strong prayer life, it's still weak, right? Because it's the Spirit that has to come into us to help us and guide us with our prayer. That's the power of the Spirit right there. God is so good that He's giving us somebody to even help us pray to Him. I mean, that's mind-boggling and makes no sense to somebody who doesn't even understand the power of God. But He intercedes for us with the words we need. And He, this is God right here, this He is God, who searches hearts, knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints, look at this, according to the will of God. One of the weaknesses that we have is we want to pray for our will. We want what we want. This is why it's so crucial to have the Spirit interceding for us. Because what, what we're saying is this battle of flesh and blood, right? The Spirit battles the flesh. We say we want the will of God done, but we ask for the will of myself. Those are what we get whenever we're pulling against the two sides of good and evil and sin and purity. All of that is battling this. So one of the reasons we get this is because the will of God is what has to be prayed for. That's what we want, and we can't do that on our own. Only by the Spirit of God can we do that. And we know that for those who love God, all things, here it is, all things work together for good, and those who are called according to His purposes. So keeping that in mind, think about this. If you connect these dots, 
Our weaknesses work together for the good of God, but only by the will of God because he intercedes for us. This is what a good God does. Takes our weaknesses and blows them out the window so that it's actually his will that's going to be accomplished through our weaknesses, things that we couldn't even see. This is how we see a good God working in our life. We see that God is good, and he gives us a refuge, right? I mean, maybe we don't think we need a refuge. A refuge is different from a safe space, if you've heard that term, okay? Let's be clear here. We're talking about a refuge. We're talking about, man, this is a place we get to come to rest. And here's what the psalmist says. This is Psalm 34, 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good, and blessed is the man who takes refuge in him, okay? Okay takes refuge, can trust in him. Blessed is the man who can trust in him. Now, you want to know what's unique about this psalm is if we read this whole psalm, because I mean, obviously, I'm just pulling out one verse, but if you go back and read this psalm and study this psalm, we are actually getting David is on the run from Saul at this point in time when this psalm is being written. So he runs and goes to the Philistines. Yeah, the Philistines. There, the leader discovers who David is and thinks that he's a spy. So David puts on this whole act and acts like that he is, uh, you know, going crazy and is a madman, and then flees and goes, and him and his men who are with him are now living in a cave, okay? Wanted men, wanted dead, dead men walking at this point in time, essentially, because if the king wants you dead, he's going to hunt you down and he's going to kill you. And so, apart from God, he is a dead man walking, and yet he is sitting in this cave and is writing this song, and the song, the whole verse is, is like, begins with like the first letter of the alphabet, almost like this memorization thing that is going on. Each verse is like a different letter that's starting out there, showing that it's something that he is writing, wanting his men to memorize the significance of this psalm, the significance of what his words are writing here. And we're seeing that, man, the Lord, we're on the run, but the Lord is good. And guess what? We still get to take a refuge in him. We get to trust him in the Lord. Even though it looks like everything's stripped away from us, we're all gone. Everything is disappearing and our lives may be coming to the end. The Lord is good and has given us this refuge that we wouldn't have any other way. We see here that God is good and his love endures forever. Now, forever is obviously a long time, right? And We could go and we could read all of Psalm 136, which every verse has in it, his love endures forever, right? That's something that we're trying to instill into our mind, his love endures forever. We have to instill it into our mind because it doesn't make sense. I mean, nothing lasts forever in this world. Even, Even the love I have for my wife will die one day because I will die one day, right? Like, I can no longer love in the flesh because... The flesh is dead. But yet we're talking about a God whose love endures forever. Here's what is wrote in the psalmist, by the psalmist in Psalm 107, 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. We're seeing this again. His steadfast love endures forever. Okay, We're not talking about just a love. This is a steadfast love. The steadfast love, never wavering, never changing. When we're his... His steadfast love is there. We don't have to worry about it. It's not going away. We're not losing it. It doesn't ebb and flow with what we have done wrong. You know, it is steadfast and it is enduring forever. Only a good God can give us a love that lasts forever. We see here, God is good and he shows us mercy, all right? I'm not, I don't know about you. We were talking about this at our Bible study on Tuesday night, and uh, one of the things that, that I am not well at is showing mercy, okay? Like if I tell my kids, don't do this, and they go and do it, and then I'm disciplining the kids, I'm like, hey, I can't feel bad for you. I told you not to do it, right? That is, that is you know, it's like, ah, I told you, warned you, sorry, good luck. Now you got to face the consequences of that. Luckily, we have a God, and I'm not saying that that's right, by the way, That is something I got to be aware of and work on. But we have a God who shows mercy every single day. It's by mercy that we're here today. It's by mercy we're in the United States of America right now instead of trying to meet underground in North Korea. It's by his mercy that we were able to even have finances to even find transportation into our church here. 
on a Sunday morning, right? If we sat down and look at all of the mercy that we have from God, we couldn't even count it. We couldn't even imagine it. We couldn't even fathom it. In fact, we probably could not even visualize a lot of the mercy that we actually get from God. And I want to go back to Psalms here on this. It says, Psalm 145, 9, the Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. It, and I know, like I said, I'm pulling verses out of these things as we're talking about them. But go back and look at these whole chapters and just see the sing, singing of praise that is done to the Lord through this. And we see the circumstances surrounding all of, the, all of the people in the Bible. We can see God's mercy at work. I mean, we just, we just wrapped up Mark, the Gospel of Mark and Tarot last week. And, you know, a few weeks ago we were preaching through Jesus telling, you know, telling them all at the Last Supper, hey, I'm getting ready to go die. You know, they're going to come, they're going to they're capture me. And Peter's saying, no, nah, oh, there ain't no way. I will die with you. They will not, I will stand there with you. And Jesus says, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows twice. And what happens? Peter goes out and denies him three times before the rooster crows twice. You get to the account then, okay? Jesus, or Peter is broken because he has just denied his Savior while he's in trial, you know, getting ready to be put to death and is broken. But you get to the end of this chapter to where the women run out to the, to the tomb and the angel is there saying, go and tell Peter and his apostles, or his disciples, what you have seen. Okay, go and tell Peter. We see later when Jesus is resurrected and is meeting with Peter, and he asks Peter three times, do you love me? Then feed my sheep, right? He's telling him, man, you have been forgiven. My mercy, there's nothing that you couldn't do, Peter, that that my mercy doesn't overwhelm. Paul, who just oversaw the stoning of Stephen, and is going out to arrest people and ravish them, is blinded blinded by Jesus on his way to Damascus. That is an act of mercy in itself, just being blinded on his way to, the, to kill other people. And not only, he could have just destroyed Paul. He could have just destroyed him, or Saul. He could have destroyed him. Instead, through his act of mercy, he sends him to a house and waits for Ananias to come to pray, to open his eyes. And we see, we know the story of Paul then from that point in time. In fact, we've read some of his verses here that he's wrote. I mean, we see these acts of mercy of God all through the Scripture. And the only reason that we can see a Scripture is because the Lord is good to all. Right? It's indiscriminatory. There's no, you know, we want to talk about all the discrimination that happens in our world right now. The one thing that does not discriminate is the love of God and the goodness of God. He is good. There is no discrimination in God, which is a wonderful thing to know that He even loves somebody like me and can even show me His mercy. The next thing we need to understand about God is that He is faithful. Faithful. We have a faithful God. And He is faithful even in suffering. Right? And I'm sure that as we look around this room, there's been a lot of people that have probably suffered in their lifetime. I mean, everybody goes through periods of suffering. Right? We're going to see that it's even necessary. It's what we read. It's necessary that we go through suffering in our lives. What you find is the difference between somebody who is hopeful and hopeless is when suffering comes, whenever you're hopeless, suffering is, man, I don't deserve this. This should not be happening to me. I don't know why God would allow this to happen. Whenever you're hopeful, you find that, man, I don't know why I'm suffering, but I'm trusting God that he's going to help me through this suffering. There's a stark difference, and you can see that in people's lives who are suffering. It's clearer to see the suffering of this. But let's look at the Apostle Paul. In 2 Timothy 2, 8 through 13, you can jot this down. Now, I want to remind you, when Paul is writing this letter, okay, he is an old man in prison in Rome, getting ready to die, all right? This is, this is one of the last letters that Paul writes. As far as what we know, it is the last letter that he writes. So, he is, this is before his death in prison. He has been suffering for at least two years in Rome at this point in time, we think, as far as the time frame goes. And he says, remember Jesus Christ. Now, I like this, remember. Let's start off with remember. Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as I preached in my gospel. Now, the reason that he starts it off this way is because if Christ isn't risen from the dead and is not the offspring of David, right, that is prophesied to come, then his gospel he preached doesn't matter. 
just stop right there. If you don't want to believe this, if you don't want to believe that Christ has risen from the dead and is the offspring of David, stop and just plug your ears and don't even listen to the rest of the stuff we're going to read here because it doesn't matter to you. You have to believe this first part as we go in through here. For which I am suffering, Paul is suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. Now, he's bound for chains because he of this gospel that he just proclaimed. But I love this statement. But the word of God is not bound. Nothing can hold it back. Paul's in chains in Rome, and they can't even stop letters from leaving out. This is the Roman authority that can stop anything that they want. He is on trial because of basically his proclamation of the dead being raised. If you trace his whole journey back, the reason he's arrested is because they arrested him, the Jewish people arrested him on behalf of the resurrection, essentially, saying that, you know, he's spewing all these false misunderstandings, you know, he's pr- promoting the way, as it was called then, and is now in Rome. He appealed to, the, to, to Caesar because he's a Roman citizen. He could have probably been let go, but instead he appeal, appeals to Caesar, Caesar. He goes, and he's in change. The Roman authorities knew this guy was probably causing some type of trouble, right? I mean, they, they would have known that because, obviously, he's in so much trouble that he's appealing to Caesar, so there's an issue here. They could have stopped any letter from leaving this house that he is bound in by chain. The only way that he was able to get letters out is if the Roman guards, who guarded him 24-7, 365 days a year, would let these letters go out, okay? So they let him go out. So the Word of God is not bound. So he says, therefore, I endure everything for, this, uh, everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain salvation. Oh, man, this is a key word here, salvation, that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is trustworthy, for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. And if we are faithless, he remains faithful for he cannot deny himself, all right? The word of God is not bound even by us being faithless. When our faith is weak and our faith is struggling, and I have been there at times where my faith is just to the point of like, man, I, I, I can't even imagine what I'm gonna do. Like, I don't even, like, I, I don't even, I can't even believe. I can't even pray. Well, good news, the Lord intercedes for that too, right? Like, we, we get to these points where we are in despair, in our life because of the weight of hopelessness around us. Everywhere we turn, hopelessness around us, brokenness around us, poverty around us, Um, just anything that you can imagine, hurt, loss, pain, suffering, everything around us brings us to these moments of just brokenness. And we sometimes become faithless. But God never remains or never loses faith. He is faithful to his word, faithful to everything that he's given us. He is faithful to what he has said. He is faithful to his promises because he cannot deny himself. There's no amount of suffering, no amount of suffering that will separate his faithfulness to his promises and his words that gives us hope then at that point in time. So God is faithful to us even in our suffering. God is faithful to guard us against evil. 2 Thessalonians, again, another writing from Paul here. 2 Thessalonians 3, 1 through 5. Finally, brothers, I pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. For not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. There's that word again. He's faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord about you, that you are doing and will do the things that we command. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. Right? This Lord is faithful. He's faithful to guard us against this evil one because there is constantly evil evil that is setting out, trying to devour us. And he is giving us this type of protection whenever we go out into this world. And when we are in this world, guess what? We are going to be faced with the evil one, right? We don't need to be faced with Satan directly. My goodness, he has already captured so much of this world that it is deteriorating so rapidly in the morality of the world that 
We see it everywhere we go. Turn on your TV for 10 minutes. I mean, you can't even watch the Super Bowl. You can't even watch what proclaim to be Christian ads in the Super Bowl without seeing the, the evilness that is just captivating the world right now. I mean, it is, it is sad what we are seeing. We walk out and we are, we are surrounded by darkness. When you leave these doors, you're walking out into darkness, okay? When you leave these doors, there's no hiding from it. We have to have the Lord guarding us from the evil one. Otherwise, we can't even stand in an evil and dark world. God is faithful to lead us away from the temptation. Just like we have the evilness in the world, when we go out into this world, there is going to be major temptations. 1 Corinthians 10, 11 through 13, Paul's writing, now these things happen to them as an example, but they were written down for our instructions. So what are these things? He is going back and is talking to, about Israel, okay? And what, what um, in the Old Testament, as Israel was being delivered time after time after time after time, all the things that they fell into into their past, all the temptations that happened to them, all the ways that they collapsed and at times died, they were given vipers to bite them, you know? They, I mean, there's all these things that happened to the Israelites because they turned away from God. And he is telling us, Paul is telling us, these things happened to the example um, they were written down for our instructions on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he falls. By the way, we're all going to fall, okay? We can't stand. And if you're going to be boastful, you're going to be prideful, you're going to collapse really quickly. You know, it, it's because we can't stand on our own. So anyone who thinks he stands, take heed lest he falls. No temptation, okay? There's no temptation here that has overtaken you that is not common to man. So temptation is common, okay? It's all common. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it, okay? We're going to endure this temptation right here because he's going to give us this escape, right? Because he is faithful. Connect those dots right there. We get to escape because he gives us or endure it because he's faithful to us. Oftentimes, and I've heard people say this, man, nobody knows what I'm going through, what is tempting me right now, or what I'm dealing with at this point in time. Nobody has ever, nobody understands. That's a lie, because nothing, no temptation is not common to man, is what we just see here on the screen. The problem is, is that our knowledge is limited to what we have ever seen other people go through. Our knowledge is limited, so, so sometimes we bask in our own pity, in our own sorrow, thinking that we are secluded from the outside world and that this is happening only to us. But that's not the case. That's not the case. The Lord knows it all, right? He knows. He's going to provide that way of escape if we trust Him and believe that He is faithful. Man, it is good to know that He is faithful because even though He gives us this way to escape, how many times do we fail time after time after time? And the good news about that is that God is faithful to forgive whenever we fail. He is faithful in that forgiveness. 1 John 1, 5 through 10. <clears throat> this is the message we have heard from him, and him being Jesus, and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, okay, if you're participating in darkness, but you're saying that you know Jesus, okay, this is for us if we say that. We lie and do not practice the truth. But we have, but we, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us all from sin. All right, so like, let's, let's just look at this. First, we need to see that God is light, all right? And if God is light, then we can't have this darkness, all right? There, there will be no darkness in us. So if, we're, if we have darkness in us, and we say that we have God, obviously we're lying. The good news is about all this is that his son, the blood, this blood cleanses us from sin, okay? So the light that we have to have cleanses us. If we are going to walk in the darkness, if we are going to say that, oh, yeah, I know Jesus. How many of us in here think about our hearts, think about our lives, think about what we're doing, think about other people maybe that we see that say they know Jesus? I'm a Christian. That's a common phrase, right? If you ask somebody, oh, yeah, they're a Christian. 
You know, like, uh, you know, I beat up on a lot of the guys in town a lot of times whenever they start to get a, uh, you know, they want to have a girlfriend or something, you know, and, and I'm like, well, tell me a little bit about it. And the first thing that comes out of their mind is, or mouth is, oh, she's a Christian. Oh, okay, let's elaborate on that. Tell me about that. They can't, oftentimes. They can't, right? I'm not saying that that's the case with all of them, but we, we put this, this belief that somebody saying they're a Christian means they're a Christian. The reality of it is people will say that uh, they have fellowship. Look at this. People will say, we have fellowship with him. We have fellowship with him. We're a Christian, but yet they walk in darkness. Okay? So that means that they're not. They're not a Christian. It's easy to say we have fellowship with that, but they're not. Maybe that's somebody in here today. I don't know. But what we know is that if we say we're a believer, but we take pride in walking in this darkness, then this this blood does not cleanse us because we are clinging, clinging to the darkness. It's only whenever we flee this darkness that we see that Jesus cleanses us from all sin by his blood. Continuing on here, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Okay, so oftentimes when you see people walking in darkness, we just write walk in dark in this. When we see people walking in dark, they'll say, oh yeah, I really don't, I really don't, you know, I really don't struggle with much. I don't, have, I don't have much sin in my life. Like, I'm, I'm kind of above that right now at this point in time. That is walking in darkness. So if somebody tells you that, be like, man, you're really walking in the dark, you know, because that really is. If we say that, then we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And that's a pretty profound statement. If we confess our sins, though, look here. If we confess our sins, he's faithful to forgive, right? We get cleansed. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar in this world. His word is not in us. But when we see that we recognize that, man, we, we get this cleanse. We get this, this washing of it. I mean, we get to walk in the light, and we get cleansed from our sins by his blood. Like, that is, that is what a faithful God does. He's faithful to forgive us whenever we recognize, man, we, are, we have to confess our sins. What Jesus serves up, his first words in the Gospel of Mark, his first public words are, repent and believe, for the gospel is at hand. Repent and believe. Repent and believe. So when we're talking about confession, we are repenting of our sins, confessing our sins, and believing in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he was, came and died and was raised for, to conquer death for our sins. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that is what we see God is faithful to forgive, not just showing up to a church service. If you're here today because you think this makes you a Christian, then why are you even here? Because this does not make you a Christian. If you are here today because you want to worship the Lord and you have this desire to bow to Him and you believe that you have confessed your sins and repented of that and are following Him and are worshiping Him, man, that he is faithful to forgive us, and that is why we are here today. Now, let's go to our hope. We're rounding it out with, the, with this section. God gives us hope even in suffering. Why are you cast down? This is Psalm 42.5, and if you read this, I mean, the psalmist is probably just broken, like he has broken fellowship with God, is, and he's writing this psalm. is just the way that these words pour out. If, why are you cast down, all my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation. Right? The distraught of weight and suffering that we bring on to ourself most of the time, almost exclusively. I mean, think about it in your life. Whenever you've had just brokenness, you've been distraught, you've been overwhelmed, and, and you're, you're overwhelmed because of sin, how much of that have you brought onto yourself? Almost all of it. Right? And that creates, when we sin, it creates this broken fellowship with God that he's faithful to forgive us in, but it brings this distraught feeling on us, as it should, because the weight of sin is heavy. It is very heavy and weighty. And so when we see this, we have to remind ourselves, man, I, I'm broken, I'm cast down, but, but I still need to hope in God. Because what we are saying is, I am hoping in God because of my salvation that I have in him because he has saved me, even from this sin that I am here. Let me confess the sin. Let me repent of this sin. 
and let me hope in God that has given me the salvation from this sin. Okay? And we can praise him then whenever we do that. It's a beautiful reminder of what we need, what we need to hear. Our hope in God produces joy. Going to Proverbs. The hope of the righteous brings joy, but the expectation of the wicked will perish. Okay, so righteousness. All right, so I actually looked up. I thought, I wonder what the definition of a righteous man is. And it is free from guilt. Free from guilt is what Webster says. Actually, it goes on and says, free from guilt of sin. Okay? That is a righteous man. Somebody who's free from the guilt of sin. The way we get freed from the guilt of sin is through salvation in Christ Jesus. That is what we have. So if we are sitting here today and we are saying that we are saved by grace through faith, then we have hope. We have this hope that is talked about here. And that hope brings joy. That's what's going to produce in our life. You won't find a miserable Christian. You won't find somebody miserable who does not know the Lord. If they say they know the Lord, they are filled with joy. There might be times that there is weight just coming down on them, right? And that is the pressure of them is just overwhelming at times. But yet you'll still feel the joy that they have, the joy that they have whenever they are free from the guilt of sin. God gives hope even in death. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13. Make a note of this. Paul says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep. This just means dead. So they've died. That you may grieve as that you may not grieve as others do while you have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, so there he was, he died and he rose. Even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Again, these are the ones who have died, right? We have a resurrection coming to our dead bodies. When we die, we will be resurrected with him, right? And that gives us hope. Now, he's talking about those who don't have any hope. So when he says, do not grieve as others who have no hope, that means that we grieve as people who have hope. doesn't mean we're not going to grieve the lostness, the brokenness of the dead. We will. We will be sad. It'll be weighty on our hearts, but it is a different kind of weightiness. We still have hope when our brothers and sisters die. When I die, don't mourn me. You guys might celebrate it, but celebrate the fact that, man, I am done with this world. I got a new life coming, you know, and that is what we should be looking forward to. And, and that hope produces joy, and we've seen this, right? I mean, I can remember, I mean, just in the last couple of years, a couple people who have died in this church, right, that were staples of the church. I mean, Sherry Frick, you know, seeing the hope that she had all the way to the end of her life was amazing. I can remember talking with Bill Harvey in, his, in, in the hospital whenever they basically, shortly after they just told me, there's nothing we can do. We don't know how much, it's not much time, you know. And I can just remember the hope that he had just talking to him, right? The hope that he had the hope that we saw in Sherry Frick, the hope that we see in others who are believers that die, actually produces hope in our own lives and produces joy in our own lives because we see that just as Jesus was resurrected, man, one day we will be too with him, to a new body and a new life. That is hope through death. There is no other, there's no other religion that has hope through death. Have you ever thought about that? There's no. I mean, Muslims try to think that they have hope through death. I mean, that's why, you know, they try to convince people to blow themselves up because they have this paradise, but yet they're still petrified of facing Allah because they never know if they've done enough good stuff to earn favor with Allah. Hindus, they don't know which God they're going to meet after death and be resurrected back into but there's ones that they don't want to be resurrected back into different things whenever they die. So they are nervous when it comes to death. Did they do enough good things to be resurrected as an elephant, which is, you know, considered sacred to a lot of the Hindu sects? I mean, if you go up to uh, Moundsville, West Virginia, the Hare Krishnas, which was a, you know, called a denomination of Hinduism, 
has a whole temple up there called the Palace of Gold. And you go up there, and they have this, these beautiful elephant statues. You just Because you drive through there, and you can see all these elephant statues. And then they have these flamingos and birds and stuff that are beautiful. So that's one of the great things that you can be reincarnated as, or you can be reincarnated as a rat, you know? Like, you don't know. You don't have a say in it, what you're going to be reincarnated as. But the, so there's a nervousness when it comes to death. Then you look at Buddhist. I mean, again, they are just trying to achieve enough so that they can have a lasting peace in death. And they never know if they can achieve enough. If you go and ask any other religion, how do you know that you've done enough to pay for your sin, your sin debt that you have? How do you know that you have done enough? Not one of them can tell you that they have done enough. And the answer is, amen. Because you can never do enough, even with our God. We can't do enough to earn favor with him. That's why we need his grace in this, which leads us to this. God gives hope through salvation. And we're going to look at 1 Peter here now as we close out. I told you we were coming back to this. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. So we're seeing his mercy right off the bat. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance, just look at these words, that's imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, that's in heaven. Okay? When we're born again, that's what we get, okay, right off the bat, just breaking these couple verses down here. His resurrection gives us an inheritance that is a hope. We now have hope in Jesus Christ, because he was raised from the dead, that is imperishable undefiled, unfading, and is in heaven right now waiting for us. Continuing on here, it's in there by God's power and is being guarded through the faith for a salvation. This is what we're being saved. We're getting ready to be saved into this last time that is going to be revealed to us in the last time. In this, we get to rejoice. Though for a little while, now look at this. This is just a little while. If necessary, we have been grieved by trials. A little while. You know, I always tell people, you know, whenever something, buddy's doing something that's hard, you know, we ask our guys to do something at work that's difficult, you know. And I'm like, hey, listen, you can stand on your head for 24 hours. Like, it's not a big deal. Like, you get through that. It's just a short duration. That's all it is. And just for this short duration, while we're on this earth, we may be grieved by these various trials. But we still have this salvation that we are keeping our focus on. It's that inheritance that we get. So that tested, the tested genuineness of your faith which is more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So when we're looking at this and we see this hope that we have, that hope overflows into praise and honor, adoration, glory, right, of Christ. That's, what we're, that's, what, that's really what we're looking at here. When we have hope, it's translated into this praise of Christ. Our hope is not found on anything in this world, so don't even waste it on that. Our hope is found in Jesus Christ and the salvation that he gives that leads us to heaven, that leads us to eternity with him. And though we have not seen him, right? Nobody in here has seen Jesus face to face. Just like the letter that Peter's writing, the people he's writing to, they never saw Jesus, but we love him. And though we do not now see him, we believe in him, and we rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, which is the, there it is, salvation of our souls. When we sit here and we have hope, right? And I, like I said, I titled this message Inexpressible Hope because we've got inexpressible joy that is here, which we can see. But there's a lot of hopelessness out there. And people need to recognize, man, when we have hope, whenever you're sitting there and you're seeing people that are diagnosed with cancer, or you're seeing people that have lost loved ones in car wrecks, or lost babies, lost, you know, husbands and wives and spouses that they've been with for years. When we sit there and we see jobs being lost, I mean, just in the news, in West Virginia, the last two weeks, there's been over 1,600 jobs that have been lost to sawmill closures and a steel plant going closure, okay? If your hope is only in those jobs, man, right now, you have nothing to look forward to, right? If you see things that are looking in our election this year, when we're in an election year, right? And there's a lot of division coming out in election year. And there's a lot of people that are placing a lot of hope in the outcome of that election. You know, I hope this candidate wins or I hope this candidate wins. 
And guess what? If that candidate doesn't win, you're left with hopelessness. If that's what you're placing all of your eggs into that basket, into that hopelessness. Man is going to fail us. Everything in this world is going to fade away at some point in time. So the hope that we are talking about is a salvation in Christ Jesus. And that salvation brings inexpressible hope. When you walk down the streets of Oakland, Maryland, Terrell, West Virginia, New York City, I don't care where you're walking down the streets at, as a believer, if you really believe, if you really believe that your hope is found in Christ alone, circumstances be what they are, people should recognize the hope that is in us. And we should be ready to give an answer. I mean, that's what we see in the writings. Be ready always to give a defense for the hope that is in us. That hope that is in us is seen by people because it is Christ Jesus. And it is inexpressible and unexplainable apart from Jesus Christ. And it looks so foreign to anybody else out in this world. So as you go from here, you're going to have hope that is beyond any comprehension to a non-believer. Any comprehension to them. But it's the same hope that any non-believer gets to have if they choose to surrender their lives to Christ. Now, as I close out here, Susan Miller actually sent me this yesterday. We were talking about this, about the message. This is from a book, Gentle and Lowly. Um, some of you guys may have read it. But she sent me this text, which, by the way, if you guys read something good or you think's good, send it to, you know, the pastors or some, you know, one of us if there's somebody's preaching because, I mean, my goodness, we don't have time to read everything. And plus, we might have to tell you, no, that's wrong. You can't listen to this stuff, you know. <laughs> this is one we can listen to. But this is... Um, Dane Ortland wrote this, and, and this is what inexpressible hope really looks like. And he starts off here with a verse from Isaiah 55, 12 and 13. He says, For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the fields shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. And it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. And he goes on to write this commentary here. God's thoughts are so much higher than ours that not only does he abundantly pardon the penitent, he has determined to bring his people into a future and glorious, a future so glorious we can hardly bring ourselves to dare to hope for it. When we're looking at hope, I mean, we can't even imagine what we're actually hoping for. He goes on to say, the poetry of this passage is beautiful in communicating that God's heart for his people is building towards a crescendo as the generations roll by, preparing to explode onto human history at the end of all things. Our joyous, restored humanity will surge forward with such spiritually nuclear energy at the creation that the creation itself will erupt in raucous hymns and celebrations. This is the party for which... The created order is on the edge of its seat in eager anticipation. Paraphrase from Romans 8.19. Because its glory is bound up with the dependent on the glory, on our glory. Romans 8.21 paraphrased. The universe will be rinsed clean and restored to sparkling brightness and dignity as the sons and daughter of God step into a future so secure as it is undeserved. That is a hope that we get to have a future that we're walking into that is secured by the blood of Christ. Remember how he provides an escape from the evil one? We won't have to worry about the evil one. Remember how he gives us hope even in our brokenness and our turmoil and the weight that we're seeing there. We don't have to worry about any kind of sorrow and sadness. This is the hope that we have that we are now looking forward to when we are his. And if you're in here today and you don't have that hope, you are missing it. You are missing it. Come and ask Jesus to give you that hope. Come and talk to one of the pastors or one of us elders and find out what it means to have this hope because it is so refreshing, so beautiful, that without Christ, we can't even imagine what we are actually hoping for. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the hope that you give us that is in us. I pray, Father, that it can be a hope that is sustaining and is pure and is undefiled, Father. I pray that it will be one that is lasting, 
for eternity. We thank you that you are faithful to your promise. We thank you that you are a good God, a faithful God, and a God that gives us the hope because you are faithful to your word, and you are good and just to love us even when we don't deserve loving. And I pray, Father, that if there are hearts here who don't know you, will you please just pour your grace out on them now. Fill them with your spirit, Father. Overwhelm them with a desire to want to know the hope that is in those who follow you. We praise you for all this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand and let us respond? Reaches of heaven, starry heights, lights of the evening, dancing in silent skies, brilliance of morning, breaking day.
his name. Oh, praise his name. Let all his wondrous works declare his praise. Oh, praise his name. Oh, praise his name. Let all his wondrous works declare his praise. Well, thank you for joining us today. We are going to take uh, communion with one another, so if you'll please be seated just for a moment. 